This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. Today we're going to look at Judge Wilson's scathing decision dismissing Tulsi Gabbard's lawsuit against Google. To recap, she argued that Google violated her First Amendment rights when they suspended her presidential campaign AdWords account in the hours after a televised Democratic debate. You might remember the lawsuit read more as a PR statement or conspiracy theory than a lawsuit, but surprisingly, it was submitted by actual lawyers, you might see the problem with this case right away. The Constitution outlines the government's powers and restrictions and doesn't apply to private citizens or corporations, something a presidential candidate should hopefully understand. Google pointed out it wasn't the government and filed a motion to dismiss. Gabbard tried to get around this by arguing that the internet is a forum for public speech. Google basically runs the internet and therefore Google has as much power as a government and should respect free speech. If you're having trouble following that logic, you're not alone. Let's see how Judge Wilson tries to make sense of it. So here we have Tulsi Now Inc v Google and this is by Judge Wilson in the Central District of California. And this is an in-chambers order, and it's written like this in this single-spaced uh, text, but it is, it is relatively short. And uh, real fun here, we're about to see them cite a case that we just talked about in February. Tulsi Now is a political campaign on behalf of Representative Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii, uh, or should I say Hawaii. Google is one of the largest web services and technology companies in the world. Defendant has moved to dismiss the complaint or transfer the case to the Northern District of California pursuant to a forum selection clause found in Google's advertiser agreement. Because plaintiff fails to state a claim that is legally sufficient to implicate the First Amendment, the court does not address the motion to transfer. Although section 1983 is not mentioned directly in the complaint, we assume that is how plaintiff brings the action as there is no implied right of action directly under the First Amendment. So section 1983 is the civil rights action. If a state actor deprives you of a civil right, then you can sue. We have previously held that a litigant complaining of a violation of a constitutional right must use 42 U.S.C. 1983. Plaintiff's essential allegation is that Google violated plaintiff's First Amendment rights by temporarily suspending its verified political campaign account for several hours shortly after the Democratic primary debate. Plaintiff's claim, however, runs headfirst into two insurmountable barriers, the First Amendment and Supreme Court precedent. The First Amendment provides that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people to peaceably assemble. Key word in there, Congress shall make no law, no law abridging the freedom of speech. So unless Tulsi Gabbard has been able to cite to some kind of law made by Congress that, that Google somehow violated, I don't think so. The First Amendment applies to the states through the 14th Amendment incorporation, prohibits laws abridging freedom of speech. In effect, the First Amendment means the government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content, otherwise known as prior restraints. Google is not now, nor to the court's knowledge, has ever been an arm of the U.S. government. The text and original meaning of those amendments, as well as this court's long-standing precedents, established that the Free Speech Clause prohibits only governmental abridgment of speech. The Free Speech Clause does not prohibit private abridgment of speech. And they cite to the Prager University case. The Free Speech Clause of the First Amendment prohibits the government, not a private party, from abridging speech. Plaintiff alleges Google has become a state actor by virtue of providing advertising services surrounding the presidential election. Under this court's cases, a private entity can qualify as a state actor in a few limited circumstances. For example, listen up, here's the reasons or here's the ways that a private entity can become a public forum. When the private entity performs a traditional exclusive public function, so exclusive is the key word there, when the government compels the private entity to take a particular action, 
which it hasn't here, when the government acts jointly with the private entity, which it's not. Plaintiff's argument is that by regulating political advertising on its own platform, Google exercised the traditional government function of regulating elections. To draw the line between governmental and private, this court applies what is known as the state action doctrine. Under that doctrine, as relevant here, a private entity may be considered a state actor when it exercises a function traditionally exclusively reserved to the state. Traditional government functions are defined narrowly. It is not enough that the federal, state, or local government exercised the function in the past, or still does, and it is not enough that the function serves the public good or the public interest in some way. Rather, to qualify as a traditional exclusive public function within the meaning of our state action precedents, the government must have traditionally and exclusively performed the function. Under this court's cases, those functions include, for example, running elections or operating a company town. There is no argument that web services or online political advertising are traditionally exclusively government functions. Plaintiff argues that by providing some restriction on political advertising on its platform, Google is in effect regulating elections. To support its contention that a private actor can regulate elections, plaintiff directs the court to Terry v. Adams. However, Terry is utterly in opposite to plaintiff's contentions. In 1954, the Supreme Court held that the 15th Amendment was implicated when a political party effectively prevented black citizens from voting. The court held, the evil here is that the state, through the action and abdication of those whom it has clothed with authority, has permitted white voters to go through a procedure which predetermines the legally devised primary. But Terry has no relation to the current dispute where Google, an undisputedly private company temporarily suspended advertising on plaintiff's account for a matter of hours allegedly based on viewpoint bias. What plaintiff fails to establish is how Google's regulation of its own platforms is in any way equivalent to a government regulation of an election. Google does not hold primaries, it does not select candidates, and it does not prevent anyone from running for office or voting in elections. To the extent Google regulates anything, it regulates its own private speech and platform. Plaintiff's national security argument similarly fails. Google protects itself from foreign interference. It does not act as an agent of the United States. Nearly every media or technology company has some form of cybersecurity procedure. Under plaintiff's theory, every media organization that took steps to prevent foreign cyber crimes could potentially implicate the First Amendment. Google's self-regulation, even of topics that may be of public concern, does not implicate the First Amendment. See the Prager University case. For the reasons provided above, defendant's motion to dismiss is granted. Because these facts could never give rise to a First Amendment claim, plaintiff's complaint is dismissed with prejudice and without leave to amend. It is so ordered. So, really interesting. We really got some great precedent in court cases in the past few weeks and months about the public forum versus private forum and, and all that uh, distinction. And we're also in the middle of developing a Communications Decency Act platform versus publisher story right now that I think you'll all enjoy. So let us know what you think of that in the comments below. I never really thought that Tulsi had any kind of a case, but I can see how some people were hopeful that Google would be regulated by the government uh, to, to, to alter Google's free speech rights. What, what's funny to me is I often hear from so very similar groups of people about how they wouldn't want the government to regulate them, but then they also want the government to regulate Google. And I don't, I don't think you can have it both ways there. Either we have the freedom of speech or we take it away from everybody. Jabberwocky is wondering if there's any chance for Gabbard's attorney to get sanctioned. It's a perfectly normal thing to make legal claims even if they're sort of stretched legal arguments, that doesn't necessarily mean you get sanctioned. Sanctioning is for improper conduct. So you'd have to point out what was unethical or what was illegal about trying to, trying to point out that Google is either monopolistic or, uh, 
does host some kind of traditionally public function. Um, I, I mean, I, I could hear the argument that they should have known that Google is a private entity and that this kind of argument doesn't really fly, but we're not at that level. We're not at the Leibowitz level where Leibowitz has lied to the court and, and made completely frivolous arguments. The, these aren't these are definitely very weak arguments, but the difference is going to be whether these are just weak arguments or whether they're entirely vexatious or frivolous. And even then, trying to make on point frivolous arguments or weak arguments isn't quite the same thing as lying to the court or filing something just to piss off your opponent or just to troll and see if you can fish for 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 easy money um we, we want to sanction egregious conduct not necessarily stretched legal arguments there, there there are some of these legal arguments have a very very thin basis in you know in trying to adjudicate when google is allowed to regulate your speech or or, or limit your speech on their platform and although I think it is very well established, you could almost say it's clearly established that Google is, is allowed to do these things and YouTube is allowed to do these things. Um, we want people to adjudicate their claims in court and not through vigilante justice or something worse. So when you're using the court system properly, even if it's on the fringes of, of meritorious arguments, the court is much less likely to sanction you. All right, that is our show, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal news and education channel. This is a community-supported legal education channel, and we require your financial support and really appreciate all of your donations and bits and super chats, and you're joining us on patreon.com slash ljfrench and sponsus.com slash law. In the month of March, we really appreciate our 50 plus supporters, Wes Delge, Aspernari, Video Remonetize, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Michael Pierce, Spirit Bear, Jan Gray, Daniel Perez, Blackleaf, Joe Tyson, Benjamin Hightoff, Stephen, Ada, Cute Grills in Your Area, Longreach Jones, Zachary Cheney, Mullen PC, and Anders Thorenfeld. And the $5 plus supporters will be scrolling on the screen in front of me. All of these supporters will be in the description of the videos that drop on YouTube. I'll put some dogs up on the screen here for you. I love you all. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Oh boy.